Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about LSU and Brian Kelly and how year three has been the charm at a number of different places for Brian Kelly and maybe it's that for LSU. It'll be really, really interesting to watch, but don't necessarily have those high hopes for them, but it'll be really fascinating if they can pull that off. But let's get into segment four here and let's talk about rat poison. If you've heard this term, I'm sure you have if you're a big time college football fan. Essentially, rat poison is just being too nice to a team, saying a team is going to walk through a conference, saying a team is remarkably talented, saying a team that is so much better than everyone else in their conference, all of that qualifies as rat poison. It kind of makes a team a little bit more complacent, a little bit more prideful, a little bit takes that edge off just a little bit. And it's something that was really the magic of Nick Saban at Bama. Um, there was every single year you were walking into the year with a ton of rat poison for that team. Everyone was talking about how good Bama was and how that defense was going to be impossible to score on or that offense was going to be impossible to stop and they were going to do incredible things. And all of that never entered the building. Uh, Nick Saban didn't allow it to enter the building. He made sure his players came every single year and said, you have earned absolutely nothing in this program. And it's something that actually Kirby Smart's doing it over at UGA. Uh, whenever you hear him talk about how you're getting your guys ready after a national title the last couple of years or after, you know, a fantastic season and so much going into this year, he just says, you know, the guys in that room have proved absolutely nothing. Um, there was a couple of guys that, yeah, they have a couple of trophies on their mantle and they've been a part of national title teams, but some didn't start. Um, I would bet that if you ask Carson Beck how many national titles he has, he said, well, I have two, but technically I have zero because he was not a starter. He did not play in those games. And that's the mentality you have to have if you're going to be an elite team in college football and especially an elite team for an extended period of time. So let's get into some of these teams that I think are going to be huge uh, in terms of rat poison and kind of fending it off this upcoming year. I have one from each of the Power Four conferences. So let's jump into this. And the number one team, I think, is the number one team for rat poison overall. That's Ole Miss. Uh, this team has been just fallen in love with by so many different people throughout the offseason, and for good reason. There has been so many things happening around there that are just absolutely remarkable, and the talent level is a national talent. The a, the talent level is a national title talent level. Wow, that was a real confusing uh, wordage. But at the end of the day, this is a very talented team. They've done an incredible work in the transfer portal to create a team that is scary to other teams, that is, you know, on the level of the Bamas and the Texas and the UGAs of the world from a talent perspective and are doing some of the things that Lane Kiffin has just missed the mark just a little bit uh, early on in this time at Ole Miss, but finally has kind of hit those right buttons, and it'll be really interesting to watch. Obviously, Lane Kiffin is someone that you've probably heard this term from. He, he definitely calls it out on Twitter whenever it pops up on his page, and he's someone that is very outspoken on this, and he's learned from the best. We talked about Nick Saban. He knows exactly how to handle this type of thing for his team and keep everyone engaged, and it'll be interesting to see if he can handle that. Um, I think one of the big things that definitely does help him here is you have a veteran quarterback and you have some veteran players on this team that can be leaders for this team. Obviously, you're bringing in a ton of transfer portal guys, but when you have Jackson Dart, when you have Trey Harris, when you have some of these players that have been around for a year, two years, have, have you know learned this system and learned Lane Kiffin a lot, there's a little bit more comfortability to this, and there's a little bit more ability for those veteran players to call out the younger players or the newer players and kind of deal with this type of stuff. So it'll be really, really interesting to watch. Obviously, everything is moving in the right direction for this team. A revamped defense, Lane Kiffin, in my opinion, is coaching the best ball he's ever coached in his career. So a lot of stuff is happening in the right direction for this team, but with that comes a lot of expectations and a lot of rat poison. And it's not easy to keep all of these 18 to 22 to maybe 25 year olds all uh, really engaged all at the same time. It's an incredibly hard thing to do. And the people that do it win national titles. Um, and that's what Ole Miss wants to do. So it'll be really interesting to watch that. But moving on to the Big Ten, this one's not even a question. It's definitely Ohio State. Uh, I thought about Oregon. I kicked around that idea a little bit. But I think walking into a new conference kind of snaps them back into place a little bit and makes them a, a little bit more focused than uh, you know possibly Ohio State could be. And this one's just a little bit different because they have every single reason to not fall victim to this. Um, every single thing that you, every piece of motivation that Ohio State could possibly have going into the season 
is had going into the season. It's absolutely insane how much motivation, how much intensity is going into this season for Ohio State. So they have to avoid it. There's no two ways about that. But I would argue the last three seasons, they have not. Um, I think they've walked into some of those Michigan games and just looked like the team that wanted it less, looked like the team that walked in thinking that they were going to win, and that's never the way that you can walk into a rivalry game. Obviously, you have that confidence, you have that swagger, that's a great thing to have, but walking in complacent is not ideal, and frankly, that's the way it looked on screen for a lot or a lot of the last three years against Michigan. So I think it's going to be something that's going to be really interesting to watch because Ohio State absolutely should be totally locked in, should not have any moments where they get a little bit complacent, but it's been a problem for Ryan Day teams in the past and definitely has been something that has kept them from winning national titles and from being that uh, team that they're capable of being. So coming into a year when you're called the most talented team in the country, when people are saying you could walk to a national title if certain things go your direction, and frankly, I agree with that lot of, uh, a lot of that sentiment, but it doesn't change that it's ridiculously high expectations and it doesn't change that a lot of people singing your praises that widely can make you just take your foot off the pedal just a little bit. And that's definitely the difference between a national title and, you know, maybe fighting for a Big Ten title. And that'll be a really interesting thing to watch. Obviously, Ryan Day and company have every reason to fight it off and should be able to fight it off, but they haven't really been able to in years past. So it'll be fascinating to watch that unfold. For the ACC, it's another very easy choice. The Miami Hurricanes coming into this year is absolutely the team that everyone's looking at and saying, look at the talent, look at the Cam Ward coming in, Mario Cristobal's finally getting his offensive line and defensive line in place, everything is going in the right direction, this is the year for uh, uh, Miami Hurricanes. That adds a lot to this team. And I think the, the thing here that is a little bit different than Ohio State is They haven't been towards the top over the last couple of years. They haven't dealt with what it looks like to play in an ACC title, to play in a game where you're undefeated late in the season. You have to get a win to make the playoff, to play in a playoff game. They haven't felt any of those emotions, and with a lot of these expectations, you feel like you're entitled to those emotions. You feel like you possibly, you know, deserve to get to the ACC title from the beginning of the season, and you deserve for Cam Ward to be a Heisman-level guy from the beginning of the season— that's all rat poison, and that's all really dangerous to a team that is walking a thinner line than I think some people think they are. Um, whenever you have a ton of transfer teams, it's kind of the same thing I feel about Ole Miss. They are walking a thinner line than most people think. Um, it's not to say that they aren't a talented team and they can't do remarkable things this year, but when you bring in that many new guys and you have to kind of ma- uh, make them all meld together, it's not. It's much easier said than done. So it's definitely something that is going to be really, really interesting to watch. And for the most part, I think there's a team that is very capable. There is nothing about this team, at least on a paper standpoint, that I feel bad about. Um, but there are areas of this team that are a little bit, you know, wary. Um, I think Mario Cristobal possibly being that. I don't want to say authoritative figure, but someone that kind of holds the reins a little bit too tightly and doesn't kind of release when he needs to. And there are certain things that can kind of get in this team's way, and it's going to be really, really interesting to watch. But they are dealing with a lot of that hype, a lot of that rat poison, and Mario Cristobal has got to make sure those guys are ready to go because everyone wants to beat Miami this upcoming year in the ACC. I can promise you that. Um, But then finally, the Big 12 I have Utah, so this one's the only one where I have a new team coming into the conference, and I think this one's a little bit different because in the Pac-12, they weren't that team. Uh, Coming into the season, Utah was rarely the team that everyone was talking about, that everyone was pointing to and saying they're the team that is head and shoulders better than everyone else, and they're definitely going to go to a conference title and possibly win it. That really never happened in the Pac-12. Even when they were a fantastic team and absolutely elite in every way, there were people picking USC. There were people picking Oregon or whoever else in the Pac-12 and not necessarily focusing on Utah too much. That's totally different this upcoming year. Everyone's saying that's the team, and frankly, I hold that sentiment as well. I think this is a team that should be in Arlington at the end of the year to uh, playing for a Big 12 championship. I think KSU is a little bit closer than some people might say, but I do think this is a team that is setting the pace in the Big 12. And the big thing for this is when you have a lot of rat poison and things can get complacent, having that veteran leadership is huge. And 
when you have Kyle Whittingham and Cam Rising, a lot of that stuff takes care of itself. Uh, Cam Rising is obviously going to be someone that is going to keep guys in check, is going to make sure that guys are coming up to practice every single day and playing with the same exact intensity that they always play with. And Kyle Whittingham does not accept anything but 100%. So that'll be really, really awesome to watch and definitely makes me feel a little bit more safe about Utah dealing with this than some of the other teams I just talked about. But overall, I think all of them are capable of dealing with it and likely will deal with it okay. But it sneaks in for a team about once a year, and it'll be really interesting to see if one of those teams is that team. But that doesn't even include teams like Texas, Missouri, Oregon, Florida State, all coming off huge years. And then UGA and Bama always deal with this. They're, they're going to deal with this till really the end of time, at least in, if uh, Kalen DeBoer and Kirby Smart continue to do what they're doing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's going to be really fascinating to watch. It's always that thing that's a little bit behind the scenes and you don't really understand why a team that came in with so much hype is not performing Sometimes it's not even a talent level thing or a coaching thing. Sometimes it's just a psychological thing, and that'll be really interesting to watch over the next little bit. But let's take our final break here, and when we come back, we're going to do a Hot Take Thursday, and we're going to talk about coaches and how I think the coaching expectations in college football are just a little bit broken. And I'll break down exactly what I mean right after this, so stick with us.